looking into a very familiar passage today. The passage will be Hebrews chapter 12. And we'll be looking at verses 1 and 2. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Yes, sir. I believe that the Spirit is saying that it's appropriate yes, for us to understand as believers that we're in a race. <clears throat> we're in the race of life. God is saying going into 2017, you may have gotten a little weary. You may have taken on some things that you shouldn't take on. But God is letting us know that this isn't a sprint. This isn't even a marathon. This is an endurance race. This isn't a race it isn't on a track. You're not going round and round, and it's even not hurdling. You're racing on an obstacle course. Well, there are some obstacles, and this isn't your regular race. Yes, sir. I'm a, a country boy, and I used to ride horses a lot, and sometimes we would have what we call endurance races with the horses. That means you don't have to put on light shoes like they do on the track with the little lightweight shoes. Sometimes you need some boots. In the, in the endurance race, sometimes you need a helmet and you need some safety goggles in an endurance race. But I'm going to talk about it a little bit. So let's, if you have your Bibles and you've made it to chapter 12 of Hebrews, it says, Wherefore, seeing, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before us endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And this is one of those sermons that I, I don't have a subject for you today. I just want to preach from Hebrews 12 and 1. And if it's imperative that you have a subject, I believe God has given you liberty. You come up with your own subject. But today he's just saying preach. Amen. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Here we see that the believer is in a race. A race for his life. He is in a race of life as well. The believer here is commission to stay in the race, yes, sir. to keep moving forward, mm -hmm. to not give up, yeah. and also not be an offense to those that are running with him. This is a race. You don't cheat your way through it. <laughs> Being a follower of Jesus, you actually treat your way through it. Right. Because we find out in Hebrews 12 and 1 that the believer that is running this race has a coach and this coach doesn't treat, uh, teach you cheating tactics and this I believe he says not this race is not given to the swift nor to the strong but the one who endureth to the end so in this race you don't have to worry about being first or last that's why the coach the instructor who teaches you how to run this race doesn't have to do anything against somebody else because you know sometimes even me growing up playing basketball if you couldn't jump higher than the man that you had to defend the coach would teach you certain things to keep the man that you had to defend from jumping at all a man we would do what we call run screens if he was faster than us and he could get around the screen what we would do was put another man in front of his path to slow him down but in this race, we don't slow anybody down. As a matter of fact, we hold them up. In this race in life, the coach that we have says that it's given to the one that endured to the end. And he says we have to run this race with patience. And I believe that he wants us to run it with patience. because One reason I believe he asks us that is because we need to help somebody else along the way. And when you have some patience, it means that you can slow down. 
And I told you this is an endurance race. And as again, as a country boy, when we did the endurance race with the horses, you know what some of the good part about the race was? When we would jump over the rivers, we could slow, we had to slow down, and that would give us a chance to look at the rivers and the trees and see the beauty of the race that we had to run. And it also allowed us to see the danger that was up ahead Amen. so that we could prepare for it. I told you we got a good teacher here now. The Holy Spirit says, run this race with patience. And you know what patience is all about. And I tell this little story to wake you up. You know, uh, there was a young preacher one time who said that uh, pastor, oh, uh, to a senior pastor, pastor, I'm having a hard time with patience. I've got some people in the church that they're on my back. They're not treating me right, and, and every time I try to do something, they say no. And every, every time we try to move, I try to move forward with the Lord, they, t they block me on every hand. And he, he said, but you're a senior pastor. Tell me what I need, because I need to learn how to have patience and, and be diligent with them. Well, the older pastor said, first thing you need to do is pray. He said, so let me pray for you, young preacher. And as they kneeled down together, they held hands, and the old preacher started to tell him, Pastor, I said, God, those women that won't treat the minister right, would you add to them twofold? He said, those deacons that don't want to share the finances to, to, for the ongoing of the kingdom, would you dry up that uh, giving that they have? And would you give him two or three more hard-head deacons? So the young preacher said, wait a minute, Pastor, maybe you didn't hear what I said. He said, he said, he said you asking for the wrong thing. He said, no, young preacher, you hadn't learned yet. He said, trials and tribulation work make us patience. Let patience have her perfect work. He said, so you need some more troubles and some more trials if you want some more patience. And that's what God is showing here. He said, have patience. And I, I'm, I'm moving all over this scripture, but you'll, fi you'll figure it out after a while. It says, seeing also we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. You know what a witness is. A witness is one who has seen it and done it. And a witness is one that's, that's encouraging others to carry on. We're not talking about haters now. But remember, I'm coming back to this. He said a cloud of witnesses. And you know clouds are above your head. And, and, and it's not like smoke that's down below. But he said, you're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. So run this race with patience. But he said, let lift off and put off every weight and every sin that does so easily beset you. You, you do know that the weight and sin will easily cause you to lose your race. Not only will it cause you to lose your race, it'll cause you to quit your race. And I told you, because of the coach that instructs us to run this race, it'll also keep you from letting, allowing others to finish their course. Amen. And what I'm saying is, to make it contemporary onto, up to us today, is when you are running this race, if you drop out of the race, then the person next to you might find out that I shouldn't run the race either. Amen. Well, I don't think the race is worth running because the person that I'm running with has quit, so, so should I. In other words, you have destroyed your testimony. And if you never stop running your race, somebody else just might be encouraged by watching what you've been doing. They might see you going over your obstacles and going through your trials and your tribulations and say, if you can do it, so can I. And if, I can't, if I'm still struggling, I, I don't have a problem because you've been running with patience. So let me ask this man that I'm running with and say, what must I do to endure this race? And it's you who will be able to tell him I'm running because my coach has given me the right instruction. I'm running because I know what's going to be at the end. He said at the end, running this race with patience, and at the end, I will get my crown. Uh -huh. At the end of this race, I, my coach will be there, and he'll say, well done, thy good and thy faithful servant. Well done. And then that person next to you say, well, my coach may not be at the end of my race. Because my coach, all he told me to do was win the race. He just told me to stay in the race. But he didn't give me anything to run with. He didn't teach me how to run. He didn't teach me how to enjoy the race that's set before me. See, because I'm just running off a of human effort. 
I'm running off of self-righteousness, and I'm running out of gas. And it's the one with patience. It's the one who is staying in the race who said, I've got a coach. You can change teams. I've got a coach who says that there's room at the cross. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. And this God that's going to be at the end of the race, he has a place just for you. And you don't have to worry about taking my place. We can cross the finish line together. And even if you get along with my God and he takes you home before he gets me to the end of my race, he'll, make, he'll put you in that great cloud of witnesses. And he'll say that you've finished the course. You've kept the faith. God has a reward for those that finish the course and keep the faith. But again, he says, a great cloud of witnesses shall be there. And let us run this race with patience, and this race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. That's a good coach. A good coach not only stands at the starting line with you and tells you what to do, but a good coach will be at the finish line congratulating you when you get there. And that's what Jesus was. He's, that's what he is. He's from everlasting from ever to everlasting. He is the Alpha and the Omega. Not only is he going to be at the beginning of the race, because he is the beginning of time. He's going to be there in eternity. And I like him because he's a good God. And he's a God that's going to sit on the throne. And you know, when you win a race and attract me to give you a medal, and maybe a trophy, but God has a crown for his children that run this race. God has a reward for all of his children. And you don't have to be first to get your crown. You just have to be there to get your crown. And then now I'm trying to move on. I don't want to hold you long. But when we look at these great cloud of witnesses, I can't seem to get past them. You know what the wit who the witnesses are, don't you? Well, if you bag up to chapter 11 and you start looking around ver verse 33, but those who are of the faith and the kingdom wrought righteousness and obtained promises and stopped the mouth of lions, those are the, they are talking about those that have kept the faith and the, and what God and what they had to endure to keep the faith. He held the mouth of lions. That means that he didn't let them fall into subjection after falling under the condemnation, condemnation that was in this race. Because you could easily suffer loss in this race. And you can suffer loss in this race of life. Well, let's back on up just a little further. We're going to look at the, Hebrew, um, the, the heroes of this faith. The Hebrew, uh, heroes of this faith is Gideon and even Barak. Samson, and I believe I parked there at Samson because these are the members of the Hall of Fame of Faith. And when we look at Samson, don't you know how he died? Samson killed himself. And I thank God that he can have one in the Hall of Fame of Faith that took his own life. So we can get past this thing of if you commit suicide, will you be in heaven? Not only can you go to heaven, but you can also be in the Hall of Fame of Faith. Now, I'm not saying go out and kill yourself because, you're, because you can't run your race. Because he didn't kill himself because he couldn't run his race. He killed himself out of guilt and suffering. He allowed that spirit over him, and that's what caused him to do what he has done. He felt bad for giving up on God. And I just want to tell you, don't you give up on God. Many others give up on, on themselves, and they give up on life. But Samson gave up on God. That was his situation, and he felt like he had done so wrong that he couldn't get things right. And he said, Lord, if you just allow me this one thing, I'll get those that got me. And God didn't really want him to kill himself, but God was faithful to his word. He said, if you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, I'll take care of you. So God didn't condone him killing himself, but God couldn't go slack on his word. He still said, all those that trust and believe in me, no matter how you die, you're still my children. And that's why I parked there on Samson. And again, don't go home and kill yourself because I know things is looking bad. I know things are tough in life. But God says, I love you enough that you don't have to kill yourself. I'll kill myself. Because on Calvary's cross, he died. No man took his life. He gave his life. 
and it was him who took his own life. But that's not the end of the story. The story lets us know that he had power to resurrect himself. And he lifted himself up again. So that's why I said, don't you kill yourself. Because you don't have power. And, and also, I better let you know that there's no cleansing in your blood. Your blood has filth in it. Your blood isn't pure like the lamb, precious lamb of God. So you let God deal with the death and the life. You let this coach that we have get you in the right, lead you in the right direction. But here's the great cloud of witnesses. Japheth and David. And even Samuel is there. And you know what Samuel did when he got old? His, his son started perverting judgment. And then he got mad. The people got mad at him, and he got mad at them. And God told him, Samuel, they're not upset with you. They're upset with me. Because what you're telling them is what I'm showing you. And you're just an oracle of me. But he said, but Samuel, rest easy, my son. He said, because I'm going to call you home. And I'm also going to put you in the Hall of Fame of Faith. So he's in the Hall of Fame of Faith. And there's Samuel there and even the prophets. And I like it when it says the prophets because he's, and that lets us know that he's not talking about a few people made it to the Hall of Fame. That means that there are some other spokesmen for the word of God that's going to be put in the Hall of Fame of Faith. That will be a part of this great cloud of witness. But if you walk down to 35 in the same chapter, it'll let you know even some women received their dead and were raised to life again. There's even some women that made it to the Hall of Fame of Faith. And I believe I had to go to 35 because the women was getting upset because I was just calling out the name of men. But I want you to know that God has favor for men and for women. Even little children, boys and girls. God said, I've got a whole bunch of them in the Hall of Fame of Faith. And you know what I like about the Hall of Fame of Faith? If you look at the Hall of Fame for baseball and football, every year they add some more people to it. And that's what I like about God's Hall of Fame too. One day when I leave this place, my plans are to be in the Hall of Fame of Faith. And if you want to be in the Hall of Fame of Faith, I say keep the faith. Finish the race. Hold the course. As they say, stay on the wall. Continue to hold up the bloodstained banner. But again, let me get back over here to chapter 12. In chapter 12, when we look at this race that we run, this weight that's in sin that so easily beset us. Well, I mean, better put some clarity on this weight. Because sometimes we're looking at the weight of life at the, the wrong way. Some people look at the weights of life. As the, and they're really just the obstacles of life. Some people look at sickness as a weight in life. Because you get sick, you feel like it's burdening you down. It's holding you back. Some people look at poverty as a weight of life. Those are not weights of life. Those are trials and tribulation. That's what you're going to face on this journey. I told you this is an obstacle course. You're going to have trials and tribulation. You're going to have some sufferings in life. But I've told you once before, that's not the weight that burdens you down. It really doesn't even slow you down because you got to understand this is an endurance race. And since God has already let you know that sickness is going to come, poverty is going to come, unemployment is going to come, that's not sin. It's what you allow these things to do to you that causes sin. That's what so easily besets you. I'm going to try to make it a little clearer because you done got quiet on me. I need some amen. When you get sick in this life, God may not take sickness from you, but the sorrow is what gets you. Y'all didn't catch it? When you get sick in life, you let it bring sorrow into your life. Sorrow is the weight that so, does so easily besets you. Because don't you know that when you're sick, God is still there? Don't you know that he's a healer? Don't you know to live is Christ and to die is gain? So when sickness hits your life, even if it's unto death, God is still with you. When you look at poverty, don't you know what the problem of poverty is? The, po the problem with poverty is, is when you feel like you can't get past it and you can't survive in it. And haven't you know, I, God has blessed me on many occasions. But every now and then I find myself right back in poverty. One day my bank account is up to here, and another time it's right back down to here. 
But poverty ain't the problem. It's me sitting there in anguish in the midst of poverty. And God is saying, why are you sorrowing in poverty? I own the cattle of a thousand hills. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. So those obstacles, I can't tell you you won't have them in life because I don't want to stand up and be lying on the word of God. You're going to have all this in your life, but it's how you set in it because this race is run with patience. And I told you it's an obstacle course. Don't you know sometimes you're going to be unemployed? But if you work for the Lord, he's always got something for you to do. Have you ever thought about when you was unemployed, have you ever thought about going to the hospital and encouraging somebody else? Have you ever thought about praying for those that are, are worse off than you? You know, woke up plenty of time and said, it could have been me. It could have been me. I could have been dead and gone. But since you're not dead and gone, you ought to encourage somebody else and tell them it could have been you. You could have been dead and gone. Sickness ain't that bad when I'm looking at death. You ought to be an encourager in the midst of all of your troubles and your tribulations. That's what you ought to lay aside. Lay aside this discouragement. Lay aside this anxiety because these obstacles are going to surely be in your life. So lay aside these weights and sin that does so easily beset us. And run again this race with patience now. Don't give up. This is the believer's race. And I'm here to tell you, you've got to run it until it's all over. And when we run this race, he said, again, let's back up to the cloud of witnesses, and I'm getting ready to close. This great cloud of witnesses, don't you know it's better to be in the cloud with the witnesses than it is to be in the smoke of hell? It's a great big difference. He says now that you got an opportunity to be in the cloud of witnesses. You've got an opportunity to sit and, and, and pray and say, there's another one running a race. And as he gets to this obstacle, it's getting to him, but I'm praying for him. And it may not be uh, Samson. It may not be Samuel. It may be your mother. It may be your father. Maybe somebody there in this great cloud of witnesses that looking down and praying for you. And run this race with patience. And let patience have her perfect work. And God is saying, it's better to be in the cloud with my children than in the smoke of hell. Because if you quit this race, if you turn from this race and you allow this other coach to lead you, he's going to lead you off course because on the obstacle course in this race, it's easy to get lost. If you don't watch the sign, you're going to take a left when you should have took a right. And I'm telling you, there's only one way to run this race. And there's only one direction. And this, this race is going to lead you up a hill. And up on a hill, at Calvary, that's where Jesus died. That's where my banner is hanging. That's where my Savior died. And on the top of this hill, they said, now you take a right and go over to Joseph's borrowed tomb. And when I took this right, I saw the cave where Jesus was, but yet he wasn't there. So my race isn't over yet. But I've got to run this race because they say, now he's going back to the Father. And you know where the Father is. He's at the finish line. What is my father doing? He's seated in heaven, looking down on you and I. I told you he was at the beginning, and now he's at the end. This God that we serve, run this race with Pacer. Let Pacers have her perfect work. Hold on to the bloodstained battle. Keep holding on. Don't quit. Don't give up. Let God have his way. Every obstacle that's your faith, God has a way. God has a way of getting you over these steps. God will take you where he needs you to go. God will lead you. Hold up the blood stain banner. Hold up the banner. Don't worry about this rain. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. He'll direct you. And he'll reward you. Hold on to the faith. God bless you.